So welcome everyone. My name's Art Wheaton. I'm the Director of Labor and Environmental Programs for Western New York for Cornell University. And I work for what's called the ILR School. And we are part of the State University of New York. And I'm here with Andrea, Elizabeth, and Ricardo to help as uh, panelists to answer questions on lead-based paint. And we have participants from Erie County, Monroe County, and Yates County on this call. And we're happy to be here. The topic primarily is talking about lead-based paint. So lead is found in your home in a few different places. It can be in the pipes, in some of the lead pipes. It can be in some of the solder that connects the lead pipes. Uh, the lead can be found in a few other places, but it's primarily found in the paint in the, in the house. So the lead paint was used early in our American history to try to make the paint harder and more durable. So it would make it last longer. But in 1978, they outlawed the use of lead in paint for residential housing in the United States because lead is a neurotoxin and lead is not supposed to be in your body. And when it gets in your body, it causes all kinds of problems and hazards for kids. So it also causes problem in adults, but the biggest problem is kids who are still forming. So- Art, can I yeah. just, um, so, uh, you know, you said it's in older homes. If I, my house was built before 1978, do I have to get it tested or should I just presume that there's lead paint there? My recommendation is any house built before 1978, you just assume it has lead. So the likelihood may be smaller if it was built in 1975 or 76, but the older the house, the more likely it is it has lead. And I, I would go with the argument, why take the risk? Doing things lead safe doesn't add a lot of money, cost, or effort. So just assume it's got lead and move on from there. But you want to be aware of it because even if your house doesn't have lead, that doesn't mean any of the houses your children go visit wouldn't have lead. So if they go to right. grandma's house or a friend's house or a school or something else, you have to be aware of the hazards of lead. So one of the keys to this particular class or, or webinar is talking about renovation in older homes because the lead <clears throat> in the paint is a problem, but it's not a huge problem as long as you're not touching it or disturbing it and the paint is in good condition. So if, the, if it's a freshly painted house, then it's much less of a problem than a house with chipping, peeling paint. And one of the biggest problems is when you go to try to paint it and fix it, that's when a lot of people are poisoning their family and their pets, because pets can certainly get lead poisoned as well, is by not doing the renovation safely. So if you're scraping the paint, you're creating a big hazard, because it's not necessarily just the lead in the paint, it's the lead dust that's created when you're disturbing the paint. You know, so, Art, I live in a, in a 1928-era beautiful American Foursquare here in the city of Rochester. We have beautiful, we are house rich in this community. And when I had my house tested, it turned out that all of the windows had huge problems. But interestingly, the interior of both the bathroom and the kitchen were painted with lead paint, whereas the rest of the house was not. And so that makes sense, right? Because those were high traffic areas, those were places where there was moisture. And so lead was really good about being incredibly durable. Lead paint was very good about being incredibly durable and moisture resistant. But of course, the problem becomes, and you're, you're talking about this, is you know, in these beautiful older homes, where are the, what are the two rooms we renovate immediately? Yeah, the bathrooms and the kitchen where you that have the most damage and the most use. So the lead paint cost a little more to add it. So the lead paint was considered the good stuff back in the day. And they didn't use it in places that didn't get a lot of heavy use. And it was especially found in windows as the number one place. And I would argue that the porches and stairs were probably next on that list, places that would get- well, and, and door to jams too, right? Because yep. of the opening, closing, any place that there was gonna be high traffic, right? Yep, that you wanted to use it to protect the paint and to protect it from the elements so that that was used quite frequently. Um, in anything around the window jams, the window sills, anything that needed a little heavier duty paint, that's where they use the lead paint. 
and uh, kitchens because you tended to wash your walls would be one as well so that it would get exposed to grease or something else. So the lead paint, because it actually has lead, which is a metal kind of like pennies, that it's, oh gee, that's pretty hard because they actually put metal in the paint, which is fine well, I, when it's in the paint, but not when you damage it, it becomes the dust. So go ahead, Elizabeth. No, I was just saying, you're, 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 no, you're touching on the idea. So lead is an element, right? And it's this thing, it doesn't disappear, right? Um, and so even if, it's, if, even if it's microscopic dust, there's still from friction surfaces, there's still going to be a uh, lead is still going to be in that dust. And um, um, one of the things that I think um, is, is can be useful for people to imagine. So um, when we talk about how much dust it takes to consider a home a contaminated site, um, how much, what, what, what is the visual that we use for that? Well, the sweet and low and Splenda and sugar packets that you use in your coffee. Uh, contain one gram, so not the sugar, but the non the the non sugar, the fake artificial sugars are usually in one gram packages. They measure lead in one millionth of a gram. So if you wanted to know how many kids you can poison with this one little packet, the answer would be this one packet <clears throat> could easily poison two hundred thousand kids because they're measuring in micrograms or millionths of a gram per deciliter in the blood, and they're measuring it in the blood. So it takes very, very little of it to make a big problem. Anyone who's ever gotten a splinter um, from any kind of metal shaving or splinter can tell you that it doesn't take a big piece of metal in your finger to cause problems, and that's about how much it takes to lead poison you is that one little tiny splinter coming off a pipe or, or, or in your finger. So it doesn't so take a, lot a very small perfect. amount of dust, a very small amount of dust, which you could easily do, which you could easily create if you're doing a DIY renovation project in your house and not following lead safe work practices or not following RRP uh, practices. You could easily create a lead hazard pretty quickly in your home, right? Very quickly. It doesn't take much at all to create that, that amount of dust to cause enough to poison you. So um, the, the key is to try to work wet, to try to keep the dust down. The two ways those little tiny pieces get in your body is either from inhalation or ingestion. So you're either breathing it in through your nose or it's getting into your mouth, whether it's in your coffee cup that you had some of the dust get in your coffee, the lead dust kind of floats around a little bit, it will stay on your window sills, it will stay in many other places in your house where trying to make sure you're cleaning up with things such as a Swiffer mop or anything as simple as just a baby wipe, something that you can wipe it and toss it and throw it away, will go a long way to help keeping your house safer. So you don't have to invest thousands and thousands of dollars to make it a little bit safer. There are things you can do right now before you get the paint contractor called in to try to help make it safer. So that is a great question. So if, if it if it requires some skill, should I use a contractor um, if you know to get work done? And and what kind of contractor should I use? Well, there's a special certificate called RRP, which is Renovator Remodeling and Painting, and it's an EPA Environmental Protection Agency requirement that you cannot scrape paint or disturb paint on a house built before 1978 unless you are an RRP contractor using RRP renovators. So you have to be a firm, which means you have to register with the EPA as a firm authorized to work on lead paint. And if you're working for a firm, you have to take the class to be a RRP renovator. So the class is not overly difficult to be a renovator. It's only an eight hour class. Monroe County, um, has offered these in, for about 10 years. They've offered them for free. Prior to the pandemic, it was easier to find these classes, but it's become a little bit more difficult. So in the meantime, I would say you would want to make sure you do hire an RRP firm using RRP renovators, and they should have a certificate they can show you that says, here's my EPA certificate that has my name and number on it, so that if you have a problem, you know where you can go for help. And if you're still not sure, you can call 1-800-424-LED 
and the Environmental Protection Agency can give you a list or a website to find the firms registered in your zip code or in your area. So yes, it's important to have someone trained because not doing it properly, you can try to, you can create a lot more problems for you, your family, and your pets. So this law was enacted, it's a federal law, which means it's required across the country. It was enacted in 2010, so it means it's been on the books now for a decade. And it requires that anybody who disturbs a certain square footage in a pre-78 structure has got to be certified. So I know, for example, I'm RRP certified, and Andrea is RRP certified, and Ricardo is RRP certified, and you certainly are RRP certified. So this is a class, and certainly here in Monroe County, anybody anybody could sign up and take it, right? I mean, uh, it was offered for free, and it certainly is a class that uh, a homeowner could take if they wanted to when they're in person again. But at this point, if my contractor poo-poos, you know, my request for RRP certification or says I don't need the number or whatever, is unable to produce um, certification, should I move on and find another contractor? Yes, I would highly recommend it because there's a very large fine for um, refusing that particular order so that there is a, a significant fine associated with the EPA if you do not have that RRP certification. So they can also put you in jail for one year for not having that. So the fines so are- the contractor should be able to just, you know, say, yes, I have it, here's my number, and have it all, and it should be good to go, as, uh, along the lines of like insurance, all of those things that are standard practices for making sure you're, you're hiring a good contractor, RRP certification should be part of that. Absolutely. And it's pretty simple to be able to tell whether they have it or don't have it because you can check directly on the EPA website sure. to find out the firms that are there. So I would highly recommend using an RRP certified uh, contractor. Depending on your county, they may even require it to get a building permit if any of the work you need on your house, such as replacing your kitchen cabinets, um, painting the exterior or interior of your house. A lot of the different companies, heating and cooling, a lot of companies need to have this certificate um, because they're gonna disturb more than six square feet per room, which is the requirement for triggering the requirement for RRP. And, and I would also say that, you know, uh, you know I, I think sometimes people balk at having to get another certification, right? They feel like it's additional paperwork or an encumbrance on their time. But part of this RRP certification is also about making sure the contractor correct? I mean, there's actually been some heartbreaking cases of people who were working in the field who either lead poisoned themselves or their family members um, uh, inadvertently. And um, there's some long-term health deficits for, um, you know, for children, it impacts the way their brains develop. But, um, and, and adults can actually see long-term health impacts. They can see kidney damage. They can see uh, sexual dysfunction. They can see issues with memory. So there's you know, this thing that, um, that uh, supposedly we got rid of in 1978 is a neurotoxin, is something that doesn't disappear, and is something that has long-term consequences. So even though it seems like it's invisible and it's just in dust, you know, making sure that not only is the contractor safe, but also everybody in his, fam his or her family, and, um, and then also the clients, and making sure you're in compliance with federal laws is, is, is all tied into all of this. Um, Absolutely. And Anthony put a nice question in, yeah. the, in the chat talking about whether it's required or not required. The answer is, is if you're doing it for money or compensation. So that a homeowner, if you are renting that property, you do need to have the RRP certificate. If it's a homeowner living in your own home, your home is your castle and you can do what you want to do, but that's still doesn't mean you should take the risk of poisoning yourself and your family or your pets or anyone who comes in contact with the house. So you're correct in saying that a homeowner living in their home that they do not rent may not be required to have RRP, but in Monroe County and depending on where you're going, um, it can be free to take the class. And there's a lot of resources so that even if I'm not required to have the certificate, doesn't mean I shouldn't learn how to work lead safe. So if, you know, if, I, and and Art, I wanted to point out that even when you know when we're when we're holding the classes again, which I'm sure will be happening, 
anybody can sign up for those classes. So I know for a fact that, that people from Yates County came and took it and people from Erie County came and took it. You did not need to be a resident of Monroe County to take this free class. And um, the other thing that, that is also a little, bit of a, a, a little bit of a gray area sometimes with the home ownership thing, um, if the landlord uh, is doing work in his own property, say he's renting it out, he still has to be RRP certified, even if he's doing it himself, because he's receiving rent for that property. And that's considered compensation. And the same is true if, you know, if it's an owner occupied double, say the owner's on one side and, uh, and they're renting out the other side, um, they need to be RRP certified if they're doing any work in that property because they're receiving rent for it. Um, so if, as, a, as a homeowner in a, in a single home, I do not need to be RRP certified to do any renovation work in my home. Uh, should I? Because I want to make sure I stay safe and I keep my family and animals and all of those things. Uh, highly recommended. Well, the penalty isn't too bad for a, co a contractor or a landlord that gets busted. It's only $37,500 per violation per day, and it can be doubled for knowingly or willfully violating the code, and they can throw you in jail for one year. So it can be a fairly expensive of $75,000 for saying, I don't care about the law, I'm going to just go around it, per violation per day. So you could for just replacing one door or one window without the proper cert certificate, you can be fined $300,000 very quickly. And there's some paperwork that can be a, a really quick tip to find out if the contractor you're trying to hire is certified or not. They're gonna have to give you the renovate right form, which informs you of your rights. Failure to do that, there's your $37,500 fine. And there's uh, when they are finished with the job, they will give you another piece of paper, which is like a checklist or a punch list, describing the things that they have performed in that particular duty uh, for that work. So they're, it's fairly simple. They should have a posted uh, RRP certificate on the job site, and they should also have a, a certified firm certificate before you let anyone do any of the work. And there are resources to check to see it. The easiest one for me to remember is the the phone number for the EPA, which is 1-800-424-LEAD, and that will get you access to a lot of other resources, or epa.gov slash lead, if you go to the website, will give you some of those resources. But there are things you can do, even if you're not required, you want to work wet, you want to have plastic is very important, you need to have inside job at least six feet of plastic in all directions around the area being disturbed. Outside, you want at least 10 uh, feet of plastic in all directions around the area being disturbed as well. So, and, uh, and you should be wearing appropriate uh, protection. So if you have a, a, a suit, you, one of those Tyvek suits, you can put over your clothes to keep the dust off your clothes. That's terrific, that's best practice. Even if you don't have that, you want to make sure you take those clothes off after you've been doing the work and wash them and not, you know, not walk through the house as you're as you're dragging and, and dropping dust. And you want to make sure you're wearing the appropriate face mask. Um, you know, certainly in the times of COVID, it's a little bit more difficult to get masks, but you want to make sure whatever mask you pick up is certified for dust. Um, I have a friend who actually was using a mask thinking that he had the right one. It turned out he'd gotten the one for vapor. So um, you want to make sure you actually read all the fine print and that you're getting the correct mask. The other cool thing that is that is something that we should be aware of is as things are changing community to community, the city of Rochester has a lead ordinance that actually supersedes RRP in the city of Rochester. And um, uh, the city of Syracuse has just put in a lead ordinance and um, the city of Buffalo has just done as well. They're all not carbon copies of each other, so you need to make sure that you're doing your research and finding out what protocols are the most important. But, it, what, what, but part of this and why it's so important to think about all of this is that our communities are actually seeing, uh, in, in Monroe County, we've seen an over 80% reduction of children reported with lead paint poisoning in the past decade. And part of that has to do with the fact that this type of work being proactive identifying that there is a hazard, understanding that a pre-78 structure most likely has lead. And so then what you do then is you act 
presuming that there's lead there, right? You actually be, uh, you're, you're proactively working safely so that you're not creating a hazard where children can get lead poisoned. So we're seeing all of the great work that the Monroe County Department of Public Health is doing, the city of Rochester is doing with its lead ordinance with the with Monroe County actually funding these free classes for, over, for a decade at this point. Um, and we have a lot of local resources available. Um, I wanted to also just make sure that we um, get to that when we have a chance. And I know they're gonna be different in each community. So um, I don't know, is there anything in particular right now in Erie County that's helpful for homeowners, Art? And then we can talk about Monroe County. Well, for Erie County and the Buffalo area, the um, city just passed a new ordinance. And one of the groups to make it easy to find information is the Community Foundation for Greater Buffalo. So the community foundations in many different cities throughout New York State have put significant resources. They all talk to each other and they share resources and information. There are some grants available. Um, HUD Housing and Urban Development typically has some grants. Some nonprofit community organizations have other grants they can do and there's um, other uh, nonprofit agencies that try to help and assist with keeping everyone safe. I was just gonna say here in Monroe County in the city of Rochester we actually have um, some HUD funding and um, Andrea is gonna put these links in in the chat. So the city of Rochester is currently has currently received a HUD grant to help homeowners and to help landlords with making their properties lead safe. Um, and here in Rochester, you would go to your uh, Quadrant Neighborhood Service Center, depending upon where the property is located, you would go to the, the Neighborhood Service Center in that Quadrant. There's also a um, home repair uh, uh, program that is helping landlords while properties are empty um, during the pandemic to actually make them ready to rent. And part of that is making sure that they will pass in, in the city of Rochester, we have our certificate of occupancy and Ricardo, please feel free to chime in and correct me or add additional pertinent information. But the certificate of occupancy um, looks for lead hazards. And if there are any lead hazards, then the landlord needs to make sure that they are fixed before the property is rented. And then while it's being rented, um, uh, uh, tenants can actually, if they see, uh, you know, because a lead hazard can happen the next day, right? I mean, you can actually identify that it's lead safe and then the next day something happens and, and, and there becomes a problem. So tenants in the city of Rochester can actually call the city of Rochester and um, request inspection. And I know some things are different during the pandemic, but this is what the lead ordinance says, um, and request an inspection. And then the landlord is also responsible for making sure that those repairs are made because our ordinance um, states or, or implies that um, tenants are entitled to live in lead safe housing. And that is throughout the city of Rochester. Does that depend to Monroe County? Uh, it's only the city of Rochester, but we all do work together to, uh, to promote that. And I think there are additional resources from departments of health, uh, depending on where you are located. And especially for a pregnant woman or a family with children five or under. So there are extra protections to protect small children so that they may have resources. In uh, Buffalo, they are trying to get funding and they have some small amount of funding for temporary housing while the landlord is repairing that home. So that can be helpful as well. So that uh, many actually, times people are afraid to move while the, the landlord is renovating their space because they're afraid anything else they get that they could afford would be worse. So there are some resources for temporary housing for pregnant women or, or with uh, families with very small children. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Now I was gonna say, you, you actually reminded me of a really important point that you know currently during COVID, right? Many of our health departments are, their resources are being reallocated to address the pandemic. I mean, there's, there's you know, you can't, you can't just pretend that um, our, our, our overworked and understaffed and amazing departments of state departments of health across the state and across throughout the counties are not all working, you know, 24 seven on COVID. So um, the lead uh, staff sometimes is a little bit, um, their ability to respond as quickly isn't as, as fast as they have been. So I wanna make sure that, you know, families understand that they need to get children tested for exposure to lead. 
um, and that I know that there's been an issue with uh, parents being worried about uh, taking or caregivers being worried about taking kids to the doctors for immunizations and so forth. But I want to really recommend that, you know, to the extent that they are able to, that parents keep up with immunizations for children, as well as getting lead tests. In New York State, the law is that all children get tested for exposure to lead at ages one and again at two, regardless of presumed risk. But um, I know in Monroe County, and I'm sure it's true across the state, you can actually request a blood test from your pediatrician. Um, in Monroe County, it's up until age 18, and or any, any healthcare provider up until age 18, to see if you're being exposed to lead. Because um, if a child comes back with an elevated blood blood level, that means there is a hazard that needs to be addressed. And that's a, that's a, different, that's a different process. And so you wanna make sure that we aren't, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all the struggles that we're having, that we're not um, uh, forgetting about this um, and then having to respond uh, differently because we weren't able to address it sooner rather than later. And it's important that you mention the blood test because there are more than one type of blood test and you have to make sure you're spe specifically asking for a blood lead level test or a BLL test because a regular blood test doesn't check for lead. But as you said, they check children in New York State at one and then again at two to make sure they can see how much um, lead exposure they have had. So that's well, we want to make sure that we request it because sometimes they don't do it. We are, we are, uh, you know, neither Monroe County nor Erie County is 100% compliance with one and two year olds. So we want to make sure people are staying on top of that. And then my question for you, because I do this, you, when you, whenever you get regular blood work, do you on a regular schedule ask them to check for lead because of the work that you do? Well, I'm not as good about getting blood tests as I should. So, uh, but uh, it is something that certainly keep in mind. And fortunately for me, I do zero work on older homes so that I, I don't get tested as frequently, but it's a very good idea to do so. Um, and yeah, now if you're an active contractor and you're getting any blood work whatsoever, yeah, you should ask your doctor, you know, check a box for lead at least once a year, you know, just to make sure that you are not uh, getting exposed and you don't know about it. It's just another, just another check on the box. It's just another way to, you know, figure out what's going on. Well, I think I answered most of the questions I had on my to-do list. If anyone else had a question, I'd be happy to answer. But I think it's important to reach out to the different organizations that know about lead. There's a lot of free resources out there. I know your organization does a great job of doing that. The Cornell Cooperative Extensions have some information. There's Green and Healthy Homes is another organization. NeighborWorks. Um, in the Rochester area has Pass Stone uh, Action for a Better Community. All of these groups are all working um, on, on home improvement issues um, and they are certainly all RRP certified and making sure that they're following lead safety protocols. But um, no, it's, there's a lot of great resources. Did we miss any questions? Anybody have any questions, Ricardo? Did we miss anything that we should be making sure we include? No, I, I, as far as when you were talking about the ordinance and um, in the city aspects of how we address that, you were pretty much spot on. Great, thank you. Sean, Sean any any I think you hit pretty much everything. Um, even with the equipment that you use, making sure that it's uh, certified for use with uh, lead dust, that, that, that was important. And the specific respirator you're looking for is called an N100, R100, or P100 respirator. The 100 is the important number. The most common respirator is the N95 that they're talking for COVID and everything else. But the lead respirators are actually even more protective than the N95. So it's the N100 respirator. And the other thing I'd like to point out is your vacuum cleaner. You want to make sure you're using what's called a HEPA vac, which stands for high efficiency particulate air, but HEPA, and not just HEPA filtered, it has to be a full HEPA vac, and that will help keep the dust from getting in the air. The worst thing to use is a shop vac, because if you're using a shop vac, anyone who has ever used a shop vac around drywall dust sees that big poof of dust when you turn it on, and that's the last thing you want to see happen is have a poof of dust. 
when you're working around lead-based paint. So you wanna make sure you have a very good vacuum. It's called a HEPA vac. And you wanna make sure you work wet so you can keep the dust down. I'm a big fan of the Swiffer, Swiffer um, wipes or the, any of the working wet type of activities. Baby wipes are my favorite because you wipe it, toss it and forget it and it's not hard on your hands. There's no harsh chemicals, it's just soap and water <clears throat> to be able to get the lead out, throw it away and keep you safe. And you know, and if you don't have a good vacuum cleaner, don't use one. Um, you know, that they, they actually can cause more, you know, if, if, it, if, you, if it's like the vacuum cleaner I have, which kind of, you know, does the same poof, um, you, you know, you want to make sure, even if I buy the, the good filters to put in there, it's not a HEPA vacuum cleaner and um, uh, working wet is, is your safest bet and just, you know, not sweeping, also not sending stuff flying. Um, that's one of the other struggles, our, our standard protocols for cleaning. Um, we can actually create a mess where we don't mean to. And that includes a broom. So if you're using a regular broom, that will sweep the dust up in the air. They have a fancy word called electrostatically charged cleaning cloth, but basically the dust wipe versions will be much better than a broom so that you're not putting the dust in the air. So trying to keep it from your lungs because you don't want to have it because it causes brain damage, it causes permanent neurological damage, and it, it's, it's not good to get the lead in your body, and the damage is permanent and cumulative, which means a little bit each day will keep adding up and adding up. So you want to be careful not to get the lead in your body. So work lead safe and work wet, and don't use a broom or a shop vac. Make sure you're using a HEPA vac or you're working wet. Hire RRP certified contractors, get uh, RRP trained yourself, and make sure you get uh, your children, if you have any, make sure that you're getting their blood work done, looking for blood lead levels when, when they're meeting with their primary healthcare, healthcare provider. When in doubt, call 1-800-424-LED and ask for help on what to do, and do a Google search for Renovate Right, and that will give you a nice pamphlet with some information as well. Andrea, did we cover everything you needed? I think that's everything. I put some links in the chat as well. So well, thank, thank you, you everybody. Everyone for Art, your thank time. you. Thank you so much for your expertise, Art. It's always a pleasure to work with you, and um, you you continue to provide uh, all kinds of information and best practices. And we're really we're really uh, happy to continue to continue working with you, uh, even though we are virtual. So uh, looking forward to when we're going to be in person again. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo and Sean, for joining us, and Andrea for helping manage the chat. So everyone have a good day and stay safe. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.